TV Toastmasters Advanced Club 9523 is hereby opened. Good morning to the Cincinnati greater area in Northern Kentucky. I'd like to welcome all of our television guests, our members here in the studio today and guests in the studio. A couple of things I'd like to say this morning, and, and I, I probably repeated this several times, but I'm gonna do it again. I was uh, on the internet a while back and I found, found an article and the article said, the fear of public speaking ranks number one in the minds of the majority of people, far above the fear of death and disease, comes the fear of public speaking. And I believe that definitely applies to me because it really scares me to death to speak. But one of the, one of the points I wanted to make as you watch the show today, in Toastmasters, we get into, seems like a lot of the technicalities of what we're actually doing. But in fact, what we're trying to do is help those people that have a fear of standing up in front of people and speaking to become more comfortable. That's the overriding thought that we try to purvey here. I had a couple announcements that I'd like to get out early and everybody needs to take note of this. Next month in December, we will meet in our temporary uh, meeting place, which is UTTV Union Township, and you will get directions and all the information you need to go there by email. That's our temporary meeting place for two months. Starting January, we will move into our permanent location, which is the Anderson Center. And again, you will get more directions. So just make notes of that. It's very important that you don't show up at the wrong place and you get aggravated and then you won't come, you go home. January 5th, we have officers training meeting. Be aware of that. January 12th, we plan on an open house. And January 19th will be our regular meeting. So everyone needs to make sure they have those dates and they know, they know about that. October 27th, which is next Saturday, the District 40 Toastmasters Fall Conference will be held in Dayton, Ohio. If you need information on that, just ask. Probably, as you can see, it's going to be a great day outside, and we're going to have a really nice meeting here today, I believe. There was a story that I wanted to tell, if I can take just a moment. <clears throat> I don't know if you all saw this in the news, this lady driving down, I think it was in central Ohio. And she was driving down the road and there was this big field that had just been freshly mowed. And there was a family out in this field of about seven. And they were doing something and she couldn't really tell what they were doing. So she stopped the car, it was kind of cool out that morning, she stopped the car and she went over to the, to the man and she wanted to know what's going on. And he said, well, we've lost our jobs, we have no home, and our kids are starving to death, so we thought we'd try to eat the grass. And she says, oh, come on, you, you should come by my house I have a car here, get in the car, and I'll take it by my house. So he had his kids and his wife and everybody said, all right, let's, let's go. So they got in the car, the car was warm for him, and they headed down the road. And he started talking to her. He said, you know, no one else stopped to help us out. We were, we were there, and you're the only person that's really stopped in here to help us, and we really appreciate it. And she looked at him, and she said, that's really not a problem. The grass by my, by my house is at least a foot high. Now I'd like to welcome the Toastmaster for today, Carol Cormley. Thank you, Mr. President. Our most welcome Toastmasters in the audience here and at home, all of our guests. I would like to start off our meeting with our word of the day. We have, first we have our word of the day, then we have our table topics master, which is impromptu speaking, I'll tell you about later. We have a speaker and an evaluation, and our general evaluator will come later. So I'd like to welcome our word of the day, Joe Schwerling, and his birthday is October the 30th, and he is a twin. And I'll let you tell him how old you're going to be if you want. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> <clears throat> My twin sister and myself will be 122. <laughs> First of all, to explain, my role today is three parts. Presenting a word of the day that we try to use and to learn about. At the end, during the meeting, I will keep track of ahs, ums, filler words, and any grammatical usage that's worthy of note. Grammar that is, that exceeds the norm and grammar that could be improved a little bit. So I'll be giving a report on that at the end. The word I've chosen for today 
from the Merriam-Webster online, which has a word of the day for October 20th, is nonchalant. It's an adjective having an air of easy unconcern or indifference. Since nonchalant comes ultimately from Latin words meaning not and be worn, we warm, it's no surprise that the word is all about keeping one's cool. The French word nonchalant, which we borrowed around 1734, has essentially the same meaning as our English word and was derived in Old French from a verb, nonchalore, which meant to disregard. Similarly, parts of it relate to non and to concern, so it's not being concerned. Synonyms are unconcerned, casual, complacent. An example sentence, Colette was amazed that Ryan could remain so nonchalant after being informed that he had won the scholarship. So we'll try to use the word nonchalant today, and I'll give a word, ah, uh, and grammatical report at the end of the meeting. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Doe. I'm glad you defined that word because I thought nonchalant was sort of like serendipity. You just, it was kind of casual, so I was glad to see that that was one of the words rather than uneasy, easy, con unconcern or indifference. So that's a, that throws me because I'm not familiar with that word. And I wasn't going to be nonchalant, but if it means easy, I'll just be easy up here, nonchalant. We have a great Table Topics impromptu speaking session. This is the opportunity when that boss asks you that question and you aren't quite sure of the answer, you learn how to think on your feet and be able to give a good reply. And that's what we call our Table Topics impromptu speaking. Our Table Topics master today, Rick Davis, is a founding member of TV Toastmasters and he's looking forward to being in our new studio in January. He loves Google Earth. I can't work it, but he loves it. And today, we're going to be looking at some famous places on Google Earth and see if you can identify them for real, or you can make up a story of what they are, in one to two minutes. Let us welcome our Table Topics Master, Rick Davis. Thank you, Carol. Well, I have some real I hope, fun things for you to look at. When you look at things from the air, they don't necessarily look like what they do on the ground. So I brought an example. This is an easy example. Uh, hopefully everybody recognizes this is the White House, right? No, no. <laughs> this is the Pentagon. So uh, if, you, if you recognize a write-off, tell us what it is and tell us a little bit about it and how it's impacted your life or whatever. So we're going to get started now. So this is I, I have some real easy ones, and I have some real tough ones. So we'll see how this goes. So this one, everybody should know, this is an easy one. So Joe, would you come up here and tell us what this view is? And if, and if you need some hints, I'm, I'm here to help. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Topics Master. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this isn't in color. Right. So you, you failed your, uh, your, your color project of printing these Google Maps in color. I happen to have Google Earth myself at home. Resolution isn't as great as I would wish it would be. So what you can't see is this is the nice Ohio River. It actually looks relatively high right there, so it was probably muddy when that picture was taken. But typically it should be more green, I believe. <clears throat> and as we all know, the best place to look at downtown Cincinnati is from the Kentucky side. So most of what you're looking at is what you would be looking at from Kentucky on the bottom to Cincinnati. You've got the Paul Brown football stadium and the, the Reds Great American Ballpark and the little hockey uh, interior, whatever they've renamed that thing for the sixth consecutive time as banks have kept changing names. So we've got a nice aerial view of downtown Cincinnati. You can even see the Fort Washington Way. So this is taken after it was rebuilt about five years ago. 
So the traffic is flowing smoothly. And again, the only thing missing is the color. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Like I said, that was an easy one. Oh, this one's a little, little tougher. Let me just say that this is in Arizona. Gordon, would you come up here and take a look at this and tell me if you can tell me what it is? This one here looks like it's really of just the terrain in Arizona. And it, it, I believe this was taken probably northeast of Arizona. No. Do I need help? Um, <laughs> it's an old, 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 old. It, to me, it just looks like a lot of dirt and a lot of hills. Uh -huh. I don't see any roads or streets or people. Right. The, uh, the distance that this was taken from seems to be too far to really make out. Other, if really, if you look at it, it almost looks like the Mars pictures you see from the uh, Opportunity that they take, it doesn't really even look like Arizona. But I, I said Northeast Arizona because I just assume all of Arizona looks about the same. <laughs> but I really have no idea what to tell you other than this looks like some kind of sandstone. And again, without the color, you can't even tell what color the sandstone is. It's gray and black. So it's, uh, I, I really can't compliment this picture a whole lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the, that's the Grand Canyon. <laughs> this is a tough one. This is a really, really tough one, I think. The, this is in New York. So let's see. Mary, you have no idea? No. Come on up here and tell us what you think it might be. I can help you out a little bit on this one, I think. The area of interest is right here, and it, and it looks like uh, water, right? Go ahead, give it a try. To me, this picture looks like the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn, you know, the river down goes under the Brooklyn Bridge, part of the bay, and the rest of it, I have no idea, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But it looks like the land of New York, the, the different uh, sections of New York, and this just looks like the river that's going through under the bridge. That's it. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is for lovers. This is Niagara Falls. A lot of people go to Niagara Falls. The, the interesting story about Niagara Falls is Sharon, we were driving through western New York, and Sharon said, let's stop in Niagara Falls. And I said, oh, gosh, that's probably like a big tourist trap or whatever. I don't want to do that. Whenever she, whenever she encourages me to do this, encourage your wife can't really encourage you she sort of tells you to do this um, we went and we had a great time it's really a wonderful place if you get a chance to stop at Niagara Falls stop that Canada right there? this is Canada and down here this is the United States and then if I remember right and this is the yeah this is the American Falls and this is the Canadian Falls there's actually two <clears throat> this is this is not a, a tough tough one but this is one that uh, if you don't get it right off you probably won't get it this isn't the United States these aren't uh, stadiums that you're looking at Darren could you come up here and take a closer look at that this and tell us what this is thank you Mr. Table Topics Master so not the United States that means it's just any place else in the world so that that really helps to narrow it down Europe. I'll say Europe Europe I'm really not certain what that is. I'm going to guess that this is France. And now that I'm looking at it closer, I have a feeling this may be the Eiffel Tower. So All right, you got it. I'm going to say this is Paris. And that's interesting because Mary's sister is in France now. So this is someplace I would actually very much like to be. I've never been to Europe, and I think I would love to go to Paris, even though I could not speak the language. And it looks like this, I don't know if this is one of those crazy circles they have. I know, I've, I've talked to enough people who've been to Europe that they have some traffic patterns that are very interesting, such and such, a, they're such old cities. And I know they have these circles that you fight your way onto, then you fight your way off of them. And I heard they're very interesting to drive on. But this is a very interesting picture. I'm sure there are a lot of fascinating things in this picture in, right in the middle of Paris. Interesting thing about the Eiffel Tower I, I have heard is that it was considered a disaster initially when it was first built. Then the French learned to love it and live with it and after several years, and, and now, of course, it's a national monument. But other than that, uh, 
great picture. Thank you, Gary. Yes, that is the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. In fact, I, I, to add to what Darren had to say, I think originally the idea was that they were going to tear it down after the exposition. They decided that that was that they didn't want to do that. That it was a fun thing to have. Let's see here. This this is an unfair one. <laughs> Maybe I won't do that. Uh, okay, let's do this one. This this one is instead. This is the Seattle. This is uh, the Space Needle in Seattle. But if, unless you know what you're looking at, it's really really tough. Um, Anita, would you come up here and tell us what this picture is? <laughs> this is the United States, and it is Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Tabletop Master. Okay. Well, I, I, have, I have not been to Missouri, but um, I do know, I recognize the dome, the whatever you call it, the dome or whatever, the arch. Um, so I don't know exactly what city it's in, but um, I do know that Missouri is a great place to uh, visit, and my grandparents are from there, and I hope to visit there someday as well. Thank you. The Gateway Arch in Cincinnati, I mean Cincinnati, in St. Louis, this is the Mis Mississippi River. This is Bush Stadium over here, so. Oh, it's another tough one. But Verona can, can figure this out. I'll, why don't you come on up here and tell us what this is. It's got a layer of, layer of clouds over it, so it's a little more difficult. But I'll tell you that this is South Dakota, and this is a very famous part of South Dakota. Welcome. Toastmasters, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, TV audience. I have no clue. I think it might be the presidents, where all the presidents are, but I don't know the name of that mount. Mount Rushmore, I think it might be Mount Rushmore, if I, my viewing audience can help correct us. I do want to say that this is the type of fun we have in Toastmasters all the time, so please come on down and visit. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to see, and, and it has like a layer of clouds over it. I, some, I'm not sure why they even include that in the database. But right here, if you if you look at the, it, it went on when it's clearer. I, I, the one I looked at last week, it actually there were no clouds in it. You can actually see the pile of debris where they where they carved the the uh, heads out of the stone, and you can sort of see an outline from the from above. Okay. Here's a really, really tough one, but Carol knows this place well. Carol. This is Ohio. This is Ohio. Hmm. And it says untiled place mark. I don't know what that is. That's pointing to the place, the important place on that. That's pointing to the important place on there. Well, oh, I have no clue have where no that clue. is. You've, you've, it, you, you know this place intimately. Is this where we are today? No, this oh. is Lila. Oh, this is, oh, <laughs> so that, that must be my house right there. <laughs> I've looked at an aerial view, but it didn't look like that. And again, in color, I might have recognized it. Yes, that's the Mark Andy right by our house the manufacturing place or whatever they do there and Frisch's. So, well, that's interesting. This is our subdivision with 250 homes in there. Hmm, that is very interesting. Yes, you threw me by, I didn't recognize it there. And so I, I do see my house. <laughs> very interesting. I wish I knew how to use that. I tried to follow my grandson's Europe travels and I could not buzz into them the way you are supposed to be able to. You can have that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> this final one, I guess I've, I've run out of people to call on. Um, this is an interesting one, and, and if you know what, it, what you're looking at, it's, it's simple. It's so simple because it's a mountain that the top is missing from. So and if I told you that it was in Washington State, everyone would know that it's Mount St. Helens, Mount St. Helens right. Anyway, that, that's, that's our Google Earth for today, and I'd like to turn it back to our Toastmaster.
Carol Cormelink. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm all shook up here from this. <laughs> that was a very, very interesting. Things do look different than they appear. Our next part of the program is the prepared speeches. We will be having Veronica Sanford is working on her advanced leader silver, and she will be presenting from the Leadership Excellence Series on resolving conflict. She is an assistant vice president at Fifth Third, a club coach and an area governor, and I believe she belongs to eight clubs right now. She's been a Toastmaster member since 2005. She's on the fast track, and she's pretty soon going to be a DTM on July of 2009. She is learning how to resolve the conflicts in her life, and she hopes that what she's teaching us today and where Gordon said that fear of speaking in public is the number one fear greater than death, I say that confronting to resolve a conflict is even greater fear than that. So let us welcome Veronica with how to resolve conflict, and she hopes these techniques will help us. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, Carol, my friend. What? You're so wrong. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever felt that? Do you know what it's like to be on the receiving end of conflict? Ever be driving down the street? You get angry at somebody, and there's nobody to shout out except the empty air in your car. Today I'm going to talk to you about conflict. Some of the definitions resolving around conflict. Actually, the benefits of conflict. Why resolve conflict? Won't it just go away? Different ways of dealing with conflict, conflict styles. And one approach to resolving conflict. The steps in resolving conflict. And how does leadership relate to conflict, and then what I consider to be real leaders. Conflict is a disagreement through which parties involved perceive a threat to their body, to their emotions, to their power base, to their status, to their needs, interests, or concerns. Leadership is the process by which a person influences others to accomplish an objective and directs the organization in a way that it makes more, it more cohesive and coherent. I'm going to talk to you about how these two relate. Benefits of conflict. Conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's completely natural in a situation where people care about either each other or about the situation as a whole, a work environment. They care about their job. It arises out of completely natural differences. There's 6.5 billion people on the planet today. Each one is an individual with different styles, personalities, and interests, values. Those differences create conflict as we try to understand each other. Conflict can create better understanding when we resolve it. It increases people's awareness of the situation and each other if you make an effort to understand. After resolution, it can create even greater sense of team and camaraderie because you understand where each other is coming from. And it also improves self-knowledge because when you look inside to see what's the source of the problem, what do I really care about? What do they really care about? And how do I work to resolve that? OK, so now why resolve conflict? Can we just let it go? Won't it go away? Does that work for you? <laughs> My experience is, is that it festers. It grows. The situation deteriorates over time. Teamwork and trust are destroyed. People disengage from their relationship and they do anything 
to make it go away. They hope if they just hide in their little hole, it'll go away. Or they talk to each other. You know what she said? You know what he did? And it grows and it grows and it grows. It affects the whole team. Also, assumptions are made. She doesn't love me anymore. He's just interested in himself. These are the things that degrade the environment over time. Now, Kenneth Thomas and Ralph Kilman defined in 1970s five different competing styles. See if you can identify your prevalent one. Competing. That's where one's own needs are advanced above anybody else's. Accommodating. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fight for my way. Let's do it your way. Avoiding is probably the most common. Generally creates pent up feelings, unexpressed views, and conflict festers until it becomes too big. Everybody knows it's there. Compromising. Compromising actually is very common. People say, I'll give you half, you give me half. But what happens is neither one is satisfied. Collaborating. Collaborating, I think, is the most interesting. Because, for example, Joe might have a very strong belief about something. Carol might have another belief. If the two discuss the various options, they might come up with a synergistic whole that's better than both of their points of view. That's the ideal. So let's talk about some problem-solving strategies. Ideally, they help prevent conflicts. They help manage conflicts. They can transform conflict into a positive learning experience and transform the environment into a positive one as well. Now, when I talk about conflict, you can think about work, you can think about your club, you can think about politics, but very often people think about relationships. They think about their significant other. Basics of conflict resolution. Understand that through conflict, mutual problems are best resolved through discussion and understanding, not through aggression. Try to understand your thoughts and feelings, values, and physical responses, as well as the other person's. You could tell when their face starts to shake that they're really getting upset or flushed at the neck. Think about what it is that's really the threat, the underlying threat to the conflict. Are they worried about their job? Is their mom sick and in the hospital? Is something else going on? Are you new in the company and somebody else thinks you're going to be taking their job? Understand when you're speaking to them that you're just presenting your point of view and you want to hear theirs. So now there's something called the interest-based relational approach. And I found these on a website. I'll be sharing that with you shortly. But the first thing is try to make relationship, the relationship, the most important thing in your discussion. Make it a priority. So stay calm, try to build mutual respect, and speak to the person as if you really are trying to build that relationship. So you're listening to what they're truly saying, even if there's emotion there. So you need to stay calm and you need to stay constructive. Work to explore various options together. Be open to the idea that that third position may exist that's better than the both of yours. Keep the people and the problem separate. Don't talk about Joe always wearing orange. Don't talk about Carol being short. Try to talk about the issue, not the people and the personalities. Pay attention to the person's underlying interests and discover their values. What do they really care about? Listen first and then talk. This is really tough because very often, unless there's a mediator there, one person starts to talk, the other person disagrees, and immediately they start to argue. It almost requires a mediator or a group setting to allow the first person to talk, five minutes, let's say, the second person to talk, and then go on. Then separate out the facts. What exactly is the situation. You said this on this occasion, did you not? 
I did this on this occasion, did I not? Okay. The steps to conflict resolution. First of all, use active listening skills. When you're listening, try to see if you can actually restate their point of view, paraphrase and summarize. Gather all the information you can. If you're the leader in the situation and you're having to mediate between two people, see if you can get to their underlying interests and values. Try to understand the impact of the conflict. She's so upset every time you talk to her, she's dis her work is disrupted for four hours. He gets so angry that he just shuts down completely and he's not productive for days. Secondly, agree on the problem. See if you can understand each other's areas of agreement and then areas of disagreement. You know, I really like the fact that you come on time. I really like the fact that you're so well prepared, but it really bugs me that you keep interrupting me. But you talk too long. Those types of things. If you can just get the facts on the table. Then brainstorm about possible solutions. See if you can just think out of the box. Now, if anybody doesn't know about brainstorming, it's one of my favorite techniques. Just write down all the possible solutions, no matter how crazy, and you don't judge. No idea is too crazy. And then you start weeding through them and talk about the pros and cons of each and see whether or not any of those could be a possible solution. And then negotiate a solution. Now it's possible that there is no solution between the two of you. There's too much history, there's too much disagreement. And in that case, it might be time for a cooling off period or a mediator. How does leadership come into resolving conflicts? What I say is that leadership provides direction, example, and a vision to which you can go towards, a common goal. If you believe in that common goal, if we believe in a better Cincinnati, if we believe in a stronger US, if we believe in one small planet living together peacefully, then maybe we can overcome our differences because of that vision. Leader also provides the team an idea or a desirable goal that helps us move past that inertia of avoidance, of conflict avoidance. And it'll also help negate some of those negative styles. Sometimes if a person is very competing, you get somebody who's very accommodating, what happens? This person always relinquishes their ideas. This person always gets their way. But how do you ever come up to that higher third unless you have somebody else to mediate between them? Really pull out that person who's always accommodating. Find out what their views are. Maybe they have some real gems in there. Now remember, negotiation pr requires profound courage. The leader needs to provide that. Without a leader, sometimes, People just go on their merry way or unmerry way <laughs> in a nonchalant manner, <laughs> not moving forward in resolving the conflict. Real leaders anticipate issues, are sensitive to those tensions that indicate that there's a conflict. They address the issues as they arise and they mediate resolutions. Now I'd like to mention that the sources of my material besides the Toastmasters Leadership Series Manual are the University of Wisconsin Office of Human Resource Development Academic, Academic Leadership Support website and the Mind Tools website. If you have any trouble, please contact Toastmasters and I'll get you the link. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. We now come to the part of the meeting that I like the best, I hate the worst to do, but I love to hear it, and that is the listening portion of the meeting where we give feedback to our speakers and let them know what they did well, what they could do better, and what their strengths are. This is the evaluation part of our meeting. We have a general evaluator today, Gordon Kelly. He is our club president. He works in procurement at Emerson. And I have to tell you, he drives over one hour from Maysville, Kentucky, 
to be with us. And let us welcome Gordon Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. It's a one hour drive, but if, if you people have not actually been up to Maysville or Augusta, it's worth taking a ride up there and just visiting Augusta and Maysville as a town. A lot of people just don't seem to leave Cincinnati. I, I lived in Chicago for years, and a lot of people seem to get in their little section and they just stay there. As general evaluator, I will evaluate the entire meeting, I guess, as an overall, but I'll also uh, introduce the evaluators. It was by uh, Veronica Sanford, and her evaluator will be Darren Henderson. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Darren Henderson. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Veronica. Now, I will be the person who admits this, even though most of us think this, but every time I see an educational speech on the agenda, I think, you know, I may or may not enjoy this, to be quite honest. But I thought you did a fantastic job of not only presenting very useful information, but also doing it in a very entertaining fashion. And that started when you first came up here, and you, you kind of yelled at us, and you, you kind of we kind of knew we were going to be in for a pretty good ride with this speech. So, you know, you had great eye contact. Um, and one thing you really did well, and I, don't, I, I call it pacing, but when you talk to us, you know, I tend to talk too fast when I get up here and talk and speak. You had a great pace. You didn't talk too slow, but also you didn't talk too fast, and it just felt like you talked at just the perfect rhythm. I thought you did a great job of doing that. Um, at the beginning of the speech, one thing I also liked is you told us exactly what you were going to tell us. Point by point, you, you kind of outlined your speech for us, so we knew within the first 30 seconds what you were going to talk, talk, talk about. I thought you did a great job of doing that. The couple things I thought that could have enhanced the speech even more, and this one would have been difficult based on our format being on television, were some, some visual aids. We did have a handout, but, for example, when you, when you introduced the five styles of, of um, of conflict or, or how people handle it. If you could have had those five, sty five styles listed someplace, that could have been useful. However, I do understand that's very difficult in this particular format to do something like that. The other thing was if you could have maybe thought of some, person some personal examples of different conflict styles. Af afterwards, we did talk about some people we knew and how they handle conflict, maybe a couple personal examples either that you personally know or maybe some, th from some people that we all know because they're p political figures or maybe how countries are late, that could have been useful also. But overall, I thought it was a very good speech. Um, you know, I've, I've had this kind of content at work and I thought <laughs> your speech was actually better than some of the things I've heard at work that we paid for. Um, but I thought the content was great and, and like I say, most especially the way you delivered it was fantastic. It made it very interesting. And you really, there really was never a lull in that entire presentation. So. Once again, I congratulate you on making an educational speech very, very entertaining. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. Part of what we do here is keep track of ahs and ums and lip smacks and all kinds of grammarian type of information. So we have a person that's uh, actually in charge of keeping up with our grammarian efforts today, and I'd like to welcome Joe Swirling. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator, fellow Toastmasters and guests in the audience. First of all, my, as far as the Oz, Oz counter role, uh, that was pretty simple today. I only noticed a couple of minor Oz ums one each by Anita and one by Darren, I believe. So <clears throat> anyone else that had Oz or Ums were very inconspicuous, and even theirs were. Word of the day, usage, nonchalant. I noticed Carol, Veronica, and Anita had each used the word nonchalant, although I think most of our, just about everyone up here was nonchalant because we've gotten used to getting up here in front of the cameras and and the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in our audience. We can be very nonchalant about that. As far as word usage, grammar, just a few things I'd like to point out. Um, let's see, there was something about the way Carol mentioned Google Earth. I think you said it so fast that if I didn't know what it was, uh, it would have been hard to understand. 
Uh, Gordon, at uh, one point I think you meant to say in your table topics that you, you, you couldn't comment. You said couldn't compliment, but I think you meant comment. Uh, Veronica, you had some nice uh, rhetorical questions, humor, nice use of the word synergistic, and referring to the gems, various things. Uh, so that's an interesting word. Uh, Anita, one uh, pronunciation, I think when you said persona, I think the, the, at least what I was familiar with is persona. Maybe it's both ways, but. And I like Darren's word of the use of the word fantastic. <laughs> Again, we tried to be very positive on our feedback. And I'd also like to conclude with two uh, pictorial comments of a uh, relative to Rick Davis's presentation. First of all, his aerial photo of St. Louis, Missouri. The table topics respondent did very well considering it is physically impossible to see the arch in this photograph. What you see in the photograph is the shadow of the arch because the photo was taken directly overhead of the arch. So if it wasn't for the shadow, you couldn't see. It was physically impossible to see that arch. And to correct uh, Rick Davis's geography, in this illustration of Niagara Falls, I've been there about four times myself, but I also do a lot of walking and research and everything. And I happen to know this isn't Canada. This is New York. That's Goat Island. This is Canada over here. Because this large body of water is the water that's backed up or that's coming from the dam to Niagara Falls and goes over. And then it goes down this canyon to get out of there. So at this point, New York is what's on top. And Canada is over on the side. And they are very interesting places to see. And they've now been building casinos over on, uh, <coughs> on both sides. So those that want to do engage in gambling, just try to be nonchalant and don't lose too much money. <coughs> Mr. General Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another thing that we do in our meetings is we try to time things so that we don't get carried away and just talk and talk and talk. So we try to keep that under control and limit ourselves. And it gives us practice in getting a feel for, for what we're actually doing as far as time. So I'd like to introduce our person that's keeping the timing report today. So let's welcome Mary Arms. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Well, the first thing I'm going to talk about, which everyone was great today, is about the table topics. Joe, you did a minute and seven, a minute and seven seconds. Gordon, 56 seconds. I did 27 seconds, which was horrible. <laughs> Darren, a minute and 15 seconds. Anita, 28 seconds. Uh, Veronica, 25 seconds, and Carol, a minute and nine seconds. In our uh, speeches today on our table topics, Nikki, you did five minutes and 34 seconds, and Veronica, you did 12 minutes and 33 seconds, which I thought the speech was fantastic. Evalu in the evaluation, Anita was a uh, minute and 34 seconds, Darren, Two minutes and 13 seconds. Joe, a minute, one minute. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Darren was two minutes and 13 seconds. I'm sorry. In the word power, Joe, you were a minute. On the grammarian, it was three minutes and uh, 30 seconds. And that's about it. And thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mary. As an overall evaluation, I thought the meeting went fairly well today. We were about eight to 10 minutes late getting started, which is not terribly bad. We did add a, have a technical hold up or two. I, I felt that the, um, the speeches were very, very good speeches. One of the, um, the problem resolving things that I remember when uh, Veronica Sanford was talking about resolving conflict is when I was a child, <clears throat> I grew up in the country and we used to go fishing a lot, and there was a lot of little kids that would go. Today, I remember the fish story like this, but 
Anyway, we're fishing and somebody caught a fish. And this other kid said, no, the fish is mine. So there was a debate on who owned the fish. And again, today I remember the fish being this big. It was probably about that big. But one of the kids got mad and bit the fish's head off and threw, the, threw it away. <laughs> so that's the way we resolve conflicts as kids, I guess. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> but I think our meeting overall was very well. I thought the speeches were very good. One of the things that I noticed that came to my mind, <clears throat> and I think we just need to be aware of it as a club. And by the way, say a club. This is the only club in my life that I have ever joined. So I, I don't know if that means it's good or bad. To me, it means it's good. But I think we need to be aware that there's cameras here and there's people out in the audience. And even though we're practicing what we practice, our real intention, I think, part of our intention is to reach that audience and to bring them in here with us. Because we need your help out in the audience. We want you to call us, we want you to join, and we want you to participate in what we're doing. This is not something that I'm comfortable doing, but the whole purpose of this program is to make you comfortable doing it. So if you sit at home and watch us in the audience, that's fine, but call the number and try to come in and visit. And we'd like to have you. At this time, I will turn it back over to our Toastmaster, Carol Cormelink. And don't go far. Don't go far because I want to say again that it was a great meeting. I enjoyed being here. I especially <laughs> like conflict resolution. I can't get too much of that. I need it. And Thanks, everyone, for your participation. I'll return control to our president. Okay. <clears throat> Does anyone have any comments today in the, in the group here that's inside the studio? Again, remember the dates that I gave out. The next two months will be held at the temporary studio. And starting in January, we will move to our new permanent home. So we will not be back in this studio. With that, Toastmasters Advanced Club 9523 is hereby closed.